the country of Rwanda, to any pre-colonial observer, would have been a veritable utopia of innocence, its equatorial location in Central Africa acting as a natural barrier against wandering foreigners. Rwandans coexisted in mutual security, neighbor supporting neighbor, to the benefit of the prosperous kingdom. For 35,000 years, the nation of Rwanda was swathed in isolation, but it was a mere four fateful months that would signal an end to the innocence. Four fateful months that would bathe the land of a thousand hills with the unmistakable stench of blood. We have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? Um, Alan, that's just not a question that I'm in a position to answer. It's true that, the, uh, that you have specific guidance not to use the word genocide in isolation, but always to preface it with this, uh, with this word acts of. Um, I have guidance which, uh, which to which I, uh, which I try to use uh, as best as I can. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I have, uh, there are, are formulations that we are using that we are trying to be consistent in our use of. Um, I don't have a, an, an absolute... Uh, April 6, 1994, the Rwandan president, Javier Imana, was flying on a Dassault Falcon 50 along with a Burundian president named Cyprian Nataria Mira when a group of ethnic extremists shot down the plane, but both presidents were killed. President Javier Imana had been the last fading bastion of moderate opinion in an increasingly divided Rwanda. With Javier Imana's death, the final hopes of peace for a dichotomously divided state were hopelessly shattered. There are many theories as to who shot down the plane. I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. Was it Hutu extremists or was it Tutsi extremists? Was it done by the Tutsis as an excuse to, to begin uh, the movement south by the RPF and take control of the country? Uh, hard to say. Or was it used by the Hutu extremists to begin the genocide that that took place. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. The death of the president, however, was not the beginning of the conflict. It had its roots in ethnic divisions which were made after the European colonizers made incursions into their territory. After Germans took over military control in the area, in 1884 the Rwandans experienced their first taste of ethnic division. Using the width of their noses as a measure of relative likeness to European colonizers, the Germans and later the Belgians separated the population of Rwanda into two distinct ethnic groups known as the Hutu and the Tutsi. As a result of the Europeans' prejudices, the thinner noses of the Tutsi minority were used as a gauge of authority. With one of the two groups always occupying the mantle of authority, the other was inevitably subjected to discrimination and persecution. There was a history of armed conflict between the two ethnic groups of Rwanda. Periodically over the 20th century, the groups attempted to massacre each other, resulting in steadily higher death tolls, especially in the aftermath of gaining independence from Belgium in 1959. In the years after this newfound independence, a genocide occurred in the neighboring nation of Burundi, of Hutus by Tutsis, which shaped political ideas of the Hutu in regards to the Tutsi. Well, we're uh, here in Bujibuta, Burundi. Uh, uh, you can probably hear uh, the guns in the background. There's a lot of gunfire. Uh, with the mass majority of citizens in Rwanda being Hutu, the stage was now set for a genocide. Because the modern president of Rwanda was not a factor anymore in the influence of Hutu ideas, there was no one there to oppose Hutu politicians and their racist ideas about the persecution of the Tutsi ethnic minority. The foot soldiers of the Hutu persecution that would soon come into fruition were known as the inter Hamwe in Malaysia paramilitary force dedicated to the systematic elimination of the once dominant Tutsis. The interior homily set up RTLM, an insidiously hateful radio station available to anyone in Rwanda with a radio and a battery, which spewed anti-Tutsi propaganda and rhetoric during most hours of the day. These Tutsi killers who invaded our country continue to prepare themselves to plant their flags on both sides of the border. You know the cunning of those people. They 
come with guns, they come to kill us. These messages permeating the airwaves of Rwanda served only to heat up tensions to the breaking point. You cockroaches must know you are made of flesh. We won't let you get. We will kill you. And then, on April 7th, 1994, something snapped. Deep within the encampments of the Interhomway militia, one general gave the order with a solemn twist of the finger. And all along the ranks, the cries were taken up by militiamen to kill the so-called disease that was killing the Hutu. On that first fateful day, over 8,000 Tutsi were ruthlessly annihilated under the 500,000 raised machetes of the Interhomway. That very day, the United States ordered a mandatory evacuation of all U.S. citizens from Rwanda, privately fearing the political turmoil could turn much worse. Publicly, however, world authorities, including the United States, refused to refer to the events in Rwanda as genocide, instead prefacing genocide with acts of, in order to downplay the seriousness of the events and these authorities' unwillingness to embroil themselves in a large foreign conflict after the embarrassment of the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia a year earlier. I think the conscience of the world has grieved for the slaughter in Rwanda. But we also know from not only the Somali experience, but from what we read of the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsi, that there is a political and military element to this. So I think we can take the lessons we learned and perhaps do a better job there. <laughs>